Hello and welcome to module 4-7. So today we're going to look at the acquisition search space. This is the final part of module 4 and through module 4 you've seen how the signal travels from the satellite through space into the receiver through the correlators and reaches this stage of the receiver where we have to search over frequency and code delay in order to find the signal. And so that's what we're going to look at today and get introduced to this notion of the acquisition search space. So let's look at the receiver block diagram. And we've seen how the signal comes in to the front end of the receiver, gets mixed down to intermediate frequency. At this stage, we have the signal buried in noise. We do a correlation with a locally generated copy of the code and then integrate the result of that correlation until we get a correlation peak. And so this is the basic block diagram of any GPS receiver. An important thing to notice here is that at, until we found that correlation peak, there are two things that we don't know yet. We don't know what the actual frequency offset of the satellite is until we found it. This Doppler value plus the offset of your local oscillator is something that's unknown to you until you've actually found the signal. And we don't know what the actual delay of this received signal is, this value of tau that we've talked about before. So there are these two values that we're searching for, the Doppler offset and the tau. And as these things change, the result of our correlation and integration will change. And so there's two things we're searching for, the, the Doppler and the code delay, or this tau value, Tau. And th that gives us a result in a two-dimensional space where the correlation peak occurs. So this correlation peak corresponds to this peak, but changes over this two-dimensional space as the frequency changes we search over this space and as the code delay changes we search over that axis there. And so we're searching over this two-dimensional axis. So that's what the acquisition search space is and we're going to analyze it more now. So when so there there it is on the left. And if we look at it from the top, what you what you can imagine is something like a chessboard where on the one axis we've got the frequency and then on the other axis we've got the code delay tau. And we can grid it up like a chessboard and we'd have to search each of these cells and we we call each of these a search cell and then a whole lot of search cells together in one particular band of frequencies is known as a frequency bin. And so typically in GPS, you'd search these search cells one bin at a time. And this is what it looks like when you do that. It, and this, this is an animation set up to run at approximately real time for a traditional GPS receiver. Modern receivers uh, operate much faster, and we'll look into that later as the course goes on. But for a traditional receiver, like a hiking receiver or some kind of receiver you may have had in a car a few years ago, when you switch on, this is the kind of thing that would happen in about, at about this rate. The receiver would start searching one bin and search at about this rate across different bins until the amount of energy coming out of the integration part was above some threshold. And then the receiver would know it had found the signal. And so that's what would happen. And so. A, a good way to think about this is to imagine an analogy with a car radio. Imagine you take some rental car in some place where you don't know and you drive away from the uh, rental car depot and you're playing with the radio and trying to find a radio station. Now you may have some idea of what you're trying to find and you, but you don't know what frequency it's on and so you would turn the dial. And so, so this is actually more than an analogy. This is literally what the GPS is doing. And if we just skip back a slide, and, and look at what, what do we have in the GPS block diagram. Well, this part of the receiver is literally the radio part of the receiver. And so this is the radio part here. And the, and the GPS is searching over different frequencies to find the signal. And this part of the receiver is the digital part of the receiver. Because think of this as the brains of the receiver, where having found it, what it's looking for is, is at any particular frequency, has it found something that corresponds to what it's expecting? Has it found the PRN code for the satellite that it's looking for? So this, this is 
like what goes on in your brain when you search over a car radio. You search over different frequencies and your brain is telling you the difference between what's just noise and what's signal. And so keep that in mind and we'll go back to this. And now we'll watch this video again, but, but just keep, keep this in mind and then you'll, you'll remember what's going on inside your GPS receiver. So this is like you, you're tuning your radio in your rental car trying to find a particular radio station. Welcome to KGPS Live 1575. That's what your GPS receiver is doing. So now we can look at uh, some details of this frequency code search space. And what we're going to do for the rest of this video is see how we get these particular numbers. And what these are is a quantified value for how much frequency offset we have on the one axis and how much code offset on the other. So as you can see, there's many contributors to the frequency offset. So let's just go through them briefly and then go through them in detail. So, so one contributor is the TCXO value, the temperature compensated crystal oscillator, which is typically the oscillator you will have in a GPS receiver. And for every ppm, that's part per million, of offset that that oscillator has, of course, you have to search an extra ppm of search space because your oscillator is not generating the exact right frequency that you think it's generating. And this is measured by how many parts per million it's off. And then satellite motion and receiver motion. So they affect the received frequency because of Doppler value. So we'll look into that in some detail in the next few minutes. On the code delay side, it's quite simple. There are 1,023 chips in the PRN code. And so you have to search all of those chips. And uh, that's just how that is. So that's a, you have to search all of that space in a typical receiver, and it doesn't change. So now let's look at the, the values on the left-hand side and where those come about and how we get those actual numbers. I have a quick summary of what, we, what do we mean by Doppler effect. So Doppler effect is when there's some motion going on into, and there's a signal being transmitted and received. So if you imagine the satellite transmitting the signal and you're in this car and you, you just stationary receiving the signal and you'll measure the frequency that the signal's at, remember that, that Number, that's one of the few things you do have to remember the frequency of L1, L1 is 1575.42 megahertz. And if the satellite was stationary and you were stationary, you'd, you'd just receive that signal. And just imagine that you're driving towards the satellite in your car, and what's happening is you're driving through those wavelengths, and so you experience the, the waves faster than you would have otherwise, and this increases the uh, frequency that you observe. And so for example, suppose you're driving at 100 kilometers per hour. Well, that would be 27.8 meters each second. And we know that the wavelength of the signal is about 19 centimeters. So in terms of wavelengths per second, you'd go 27.8 meters divided by 0.19. That's how many wavelengths per second works out to 146 wavelengths per second, which is 146 hertz. So that's how we can work out the effect of the m motion of the receiver. Now, what about the motion of the satellite? So to, what are the limits of the Doppler frequencies for rising and setting satellites? So, so let's set up the picture here where we, we have the Earth. You see three people there standing on the Earth. And imagine the satellite orbiting. For, for the purpose of this exercise, you can imagine that the orbit is perfectly circular. That's, that's close enough to the truth to be correct. And so the, the satellite is orbiting around the Earth, as shown at the moment its uh, velocity is uh, perfectly up in this picture. And so these different people will see different things. The, the red person sees the satellite setting, and the blue person sees the satellite rising. And if we, if we dive, add some uh, lines to this picture, you can see why the satellite's just going below the horizon line of the red person. So they're seeing the satellite setting, and it's just coming above the horizon line of the blue person. So they see the satellite rising. And you'll notice that for the person in the middle, the satellite's going directly overhead them. And so its motion is perpendicular to the, the line between them and the satellite. So it's neither getting closer nor further from them. 
now it's going, if you look at the red person, the satellite's actually getting further away from them as it sets. And so that's why we, we made that person red. It's like a red shift. The satellite's moving away from you. And conversely, it's like a blue shift when the satellite's rising. And so from that picture, you can see how a, a rising satellite is moving towards you. As it reaches its zenith in space, it's as close to you as it's going to get. And then as it's setting, it's moving away from you. So the Doppler limits occur as the satellite's rising or setting. And so what are, what are those Doppler limits? Well, well let's uh, go in and do a little bit of geometry on this picture. So the Doppler value will be this the unit vector in the direction of you. So if you so for the moment let's suppose you you this person let's put you back there. And the observed Doppler will be the velocity v dot product this unit vector e. And so the magnitude the Doppler that you will observe is v dot product e, which is magnitude of v, magnitude of e, cosine of the angle between the two of these vectors. That's that angle here. Well, that angle is just 90 minus alpha, as you can see from the diagram. And so what is that equal to? Well, uh, we've got magnitude of velocity. The e is a unit vector, so its magnitude is 1. And then cosine of 90 minus alpha is just sine of alpha. And well, that's equal to, well, we can see what sine alpha is because we've got a right angle, tri right angle triangle here. So it's the opposite side, r sub e, over the hypotenuse, r sub s. So it's magnitude of v, r sub e over r sub s. Well, that's just the ratio of the radius of the Earth to the orbital radius. So uh, if we put actual numbers to that, let's clean this up a little bit, we get this equation. So there, there it is written a bit neater. And the, the numbers that you need are to know that the satellite speed in Earth's center Earth fixed coordinates is bounded by 3.3 kilometers per second. So that gives us our magnitude of v. That's this value here. Now, what's the radius of the Earth? So I think it's worth a minute to just uh, go over this because it's a it's a value that you really should know. And like I like to say uh, in this lecture series, the less you have to remember, the better. The more you can understand, the less you have to remember. So the thing to understand about the radius of the Earth is that you can you can derive it from the definition of the meter. You might not know this, but the meter was defined in 1791 about 220 years ago by the French Academy of Sciences. And they decided that there should be 10 million meters in a quarter of the Earth. So if you took the North Pole here and the equator, by definition, the French Academy of Sciences said there will be 10 million meters along that arc. That, that is actually the original definition of the meter. And so, so just using that value, it's quite easy to derive the radius of the Earth because the radius of the Earth times 2 pi must give us 40 million meters or 40,000 kilometers. So say that another way, the radius of the Earth is 40,000 kilometers divided by 2 times and if you just put that into your calculator, you'll get this number, 6,370 kilometers. So you never have to remember that as long as you understand the definition of the meter, the original definition of the meter. And then the radius of the satellites, you can look that up in the almanac for the satellites, but that's 26,500 kilometers approximately. And we do that little sum, we get 793 meters per second. So that's the bound on the satellite Doppler values, and it'll be one sign when the satellite's rising and another sign when the satellite's setting. So now let's look at the bounds on the Doppler values for the receiver. We, we saw previously on an explanation of Doppler how for uh, each kilometer per hour, we got 1.46 hertz uh, of Doppler effect from driving towards the satellite. and Driving towards or away from the satellite is th the worst case. It's going to be less if the satellite's a little bit above, as shown here. But uh, 
before getting into that, let's let's just look at this in terms of parts per billion of the wavelength. So if we represent 1.46 hertz as approximately 1.5 hertz, then you'll recognize that that's a almost exactly one part per billion of the wavelength because the wavelength the uh, of the frequency because the frequency of GPS is 1.5 seven five four two gigahertz gigahertz so one part per billion is about 1.5 hertz because giga here is a billion so that's how we we get this relationship and it's a nice little rule of thumb to remember approximately it's not exactly because of the point the seven five here but approximately one part per billion of Doppler effect for each kilometer per hour that a receiver moves. So for example, a receiver in a car. And that's the worst case, of course. Uh, so we have a less than one part per billion per kilometer per hour. And if we express it like we did before in terms of 100 kilometer per hour, that's 100 parts per billion per 100 kilometers per hour, or to go to parts per million, which we, we have uh, to compare to everything else, 0.1 part per million for each 100 kilometer per hour that used. And that's the upper bound on the effect of the receiver speed. So now, for our last slide, we can go back to this picture and see where all these things come about. So, so the, for the TCXO value, there's for each part per million that it is off, it in, of course induces a part per million of error. So you have to search one part per million per part per million. And then, like we show at the top here, remember that one part per million is 1575 hertz because L1 is 1575 megahertz, million. And so one part per million is 1.575 kilohertz. And I like to show everything here in kilohertz so you can see the comparative size of these different effects. So, so from that little bit of arithmetic, we have a 1.575 kilohertz offset per part per million of TCXO offset. For the satellite motion, you just saw how we had the 4.2 kilohertz from our uh, calculation using the radius of the Earth and the radius of the satellite orbit. And if we divide by 1.575, we get 2.6 ppm. And for the receiver speed, you just saw how we get 0.1 ppm for each 100 kilometer per hour of receiver speed. And so for typical values of these, like a TCXO offset of a ppm is roughly typical and 100 kilometers per hour, roughly typical for a car, you see the relative effects. The biggest effect, the biggest search we have to do in Doppler is because of the satellite motion itself. The next biggest search is because of the TCXO offset, and the receiver speed has quite a small effect, as shown here. So these are all going to be important in Module 5 when we look at assisted GPS, where assistance is what helps us search this area better.